consider this simple audio interface. It's got two inputs and you can record two input signals simultaneously. You'd want full control over the two signals and you'd want to apply the effects on one of them without affecting the other. So you don't want the two signals to be mixed and summed up together before going into the analog to digital converter. The only way to do this is for each input pathway to be made up of a fully fleshed out analog to digital converter. Now consider this multi-track recorder. You've got eight inputs and you can record a drum kit or a choir. Again, to separate the signals, you need eight different ADCs. As we saw in the earlier videos, ADCs are fairly complex circuits with very specialized components. So every new input drives the cost up for the device. Right, but if you look at how these multiple channels of signals are transmitted to a computer, they're usually via USB, Firewire, or Thunderbolt. And they're all serial communication channels. USB even has serial in its name. Now the question is, how do we take this set of digital signals that are generated and transmit them along a single serial channel? We make use of multiplexing. A multiplexer is a component used to combine two or more signals for serial transmission. Several multiplexing techniques are around, but for digital signals, time division multiplexing is the predominant one. It's quite simple, really. Think about it as a component where several inputs come in and one output goes out. Each input signal gets through for a limited duration of time before it's the turn of the next signal. It's a simple round-robin mechanism where a snippet of each signal gets through and the whole process loops back around at the end. As long as the time duration is constant, we get equal length snippets of each input signal in the output. In the simplest case, where there are two input signals, the snippets are arranged alternatively. This is called interleaving and is common in all digital media that's multi-dimensional. The duration is important here. A lot of the time, the length of the snippet is as long as the sample word length, just enough to represent exactly one sample of the audio. In more cases than not, they're the length of a group of samples, sometimes called a frame. Going the other way now, audio devices can play back multiple channels of audio at the same time. Two channels in stereo, five plus one channel in most surround sound systems, eight channels in octophonic recordings. Whatever the channel count may be, the digital output signal would have all the channels interleaved in it. Before going into digital to analog converters, the signal is demultiplexed. This component would split the signal into its constituent parts and reassemble them into independent channels. Even during storage, the digital signal is stored interleaved. The simple reason for interleaving and not storing a channel in its entirety, one after another, is that seeking becomes more efficient. A read pointer would not have to go back and forth to fetch samples. An interleaved signal would have all the channel's samples for a particular moment in time available in the same general vicinity in physical storage. Oh my stars for the love of Liza! You scratch my CD! Ever wondered how a scratchy CD can be played back and still get almost seamless output without any glitches or dropouts? If you look at the scale of the problem, it's even more astonishing. The average width of a human hair is around 70 micrometers. In comparison, the width of the pits that are etched into the surface of the CD are around one micrometer. So a single scratch could potentially wipe out hundreds to thousands of bits of data. Sometimes the destruction is so massive that parts of the original information is irrecoverably lost and these sections would result in unexpected glitches or dropouts in the audio. But most of the time, the damaged information can be recovered back and corrected even to get back the original information exactly or in a form that's similar at least. How do we do this? We can add some redundancies. The most brutish way to go about this would be to replicate the entire information set. If you have three exact copies of the audio data, 
you can make a comparison bit by bit. If one of them doesn't match the other two, we can probabilistically rely on the two that did match to be correct. If two of the bits were erroneous at the same time, then tough luck, the data is ambiguous and there might not be a way to retrieve it. Naturally, you might be thinking, having a redundancy of three copies is overkill. And you'd be right, it's a waste of space and we'd be using up two thirds of the storage capacity of the medium for storing redundancies. Engineers have found clever ways of adding redundancy by surgically putting error correction bits in strategic parts of the audio frame data. With this approach, you can essentially detect errors and even correct them, all the while minimizing the storage required for redundancy. The cornerstone for audio detection and correction is redundancy. Without this, there is no way to detect errors. Take a look at this sentence. How long did it take you to detect that there were errors in it and correct all of them to form a meaningful sentence? Not long, I presume. It's estimated that the written English language is about 50% redundant. There are a lot of identifiable features, like the first and last letters of the word, the number of characters that a word is made up of, and the consonants that appear. I could scramble the first word completely and you could still make out the sentence and complete it based on the context of usage. But taken on its own, it can't really be corrected. The original meaning is lost. There are a couple of points we can take away from this example. Redundancy is not always obvious and easy to recognize. There are subtle ways to detect and correct errors, and a lot of these algorithms rely on complicated mathematics to achieve this. The second point, which is probably the most important one, is that you cannot correct every error. You can introduce a certain level of resilience to errors into the system, but beyond a certain threshold, you just don't have the redundancy to correct large errors. I'm not going to delve into the specifics of the algorithms used for detecting and correcting errors. They can get very technical very soon. The reason I'm not going to focus on it is because we as audio engineers or programmers don't deal with this directly. Error correction is mainly built into storage media that could degrade over time. It's also added into digital signals during transmission. But on a computer, when you write to a file or interact with audio at the byte level, we never have to deal with error correction. The files that are written to disk don't contain error correction redundancies. That's handled by the operating system, where it does its own storage and memory management. But if you are curious to know more, definitely go check them out. It's very interesting how they approach the problem. I'll give you a list of topics that you could search for. For error detection, the simplest way is to make use of parity bits. Other methods used are checksums and cyclic redundancy checks. For error correction, Coding schemes are used to introduce redundancy bits surgically into the data frames based on some pre-calculated conditions. These include Hamming codes, convolution codes, and Reed-Solomon codes. You can check out this excellent video on error correction and Hamming codes by 3Blue1Brown, where he wonderfully illustrates the technicalities of the process. In the previous video on encoding, I brought up this diagram. It's a high-level workflow diagram for getting a signal in the analog domain into a fully functional, transmissible digital signal. It took a while for us to get here, and a lot has been done and said. The topics that I talk about barely scratch the surface. The details are mind-numbingly more intricate. But that's for you to explore. If something catches your eye, don't hesitate to get your hands dirty. You never know where it might take you. In the next video in the series, we'll finally take this digital signal into the realm of computers. We'll see how we can save and handle audio as files.